The kingdom was the central theme of Jesus' ministry. And it's something that we should never miss. He used the word kingdom more than 125 times. For example, Matthew 4 verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then Matthew 4 verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You can also see that in Matthew 9 verse 35. And then later on in Acts 1 verse 3, it says that Jesus appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, what was this kingdom? Well, in Matthew 13, we find the parables of the kingdom. We're all familiar with those. We find the parable of the soils the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, the parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the pearl of great price, the parable of the net, and the parable of the owner of a house. And those last five of them are unique to Matthew's gospel. Jesus used the word kingdom in four distinct ways. Um, he first spoke about the kingdom, then he spoke about the kingdom of God, he spoke about the kingdom of heaven, but we find that in Matthew's gospel only, and then we speak about the kingdom of the, he spoke about the kingdom of the Father. Now, there's nothing strange about the fact that the kingdom of heaven occurs in Matthew only. Matthew was a very Jewish gospel, and in the Jewish tradition, they try to minimize, out of respect for God, the use of the word God. So they just substitute, he just substituted the word heaven for God. They, they, they mean exactly the same. Now, the word kingdom from the Greek basilia means the active or dynamic reign and rule of God. Now we find different manifestations of the kingdom of God. There is the kingdom of God eternal. In other words, God who has eternally reigned in the heavenly realms. Then we find that God reigns in covenant in the Old Testament. We find that God reigns through Jesus in the Gospels. But then God reigns through the church as well, from the Acts to the Parousia, in other words, to the second coming. And then again, we find a fifth manifestation of the kingdom of God, the eschatological kingdom of God, God eternally reigning hereafter in the heavenly realms. We find the kingdom of God described Many other times outside the Gospels, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 2, it says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. All the things that we do in ministry, when we share the gospel, we do this in view of his appearing and his kingdom. Very importantly, we always need to keep this in mind. 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely back to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1 verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patience endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Right here, we already see three examples of the use of the word kingdom. And you can really recognize it is not that simple to simply substitute the word kingdom 
for the word church. And that is something that we'll get to a, a little bit later. We can't say heavenly church, for example, in 2 Timothy 4 verse 18. It is not that simple. Now, the kingdom of God is presented throughout the gospel in four different ways. It's firstly represented as a past kingdom, as God reigning, having reigned as king over Israel and his covenant people up to that point. But it's also a present reality because Jesus is a messianic king. He had arrived. Therefore, the kingdom is with Jesus and the kingdom is present in the life and ministry of Jesus. But the kingdom is also presented as near future. In other words, in the coming church of King Jesus. But then lastly, the kingdom is also presented as distant future in the eschatological kingdom of God, the end times kingdom of God. But then Jesus also said, my kingdom is not of this world. We can read in John 18, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to present my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king? In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Very importantly, and this is often a misunderstanding, Jesus did not mean my kingdom is not in this world. He said my kingdom is not of this world. He certainly did not mean that his kingdom has no interaction or claims to make about this world. On the contrary, it has everything to do with this world. Some more misunderstandings about the kingdom of God is something that we'll go through right now and will also present a more biblical view of the kingdom of God. The first misunderstanding about the kingdom of God we could call a non-eschatological understanding. Eschaton, just a reminder, means last things. So eschatology is the study of last things or the study of the end of time. The non-eschatological school of thought says that few or none of the teachings of Jesus were about the end of time. And a favored verse by these supporters is, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst so people who believe the kingdom of god was only who believe this believe that the kingdom of god is something that already occurred uh, it was around during the time of jesus um to continue that explanation um and steve Kennard explains this quite well he says this view it means that the kingdom of god represents the reign of god in the individual soul as the individual is transformed into god's image now this is not something that steve Kennard claims he's just explaining this particular view and this is something that you will encounter at time the kingdom of god is within you and it's a very inward focused view and it narrows down the kingdom of god to a personal experience. Another example that you might encounter is called the imminent eschatological understanding. And the claim that those people make is Jesus saw himself as king of the eschatological kingdom. He spoke about the kingdom coming in the apostles' lifetime within their generation. And they'll refer to Mark 13 verse 13. And um, those those people, and those are, these are mostly scholars and not really biblical believers, they say they, they believe that Jesus miscalculated, actually, that he got his followers excited for nothing, and his misguided teachings led to his crucifixion. Um, they believe that Jesus' disciples continue to cling to his teachings after his death, still longing for the kingdom that did not come, 
during his lifetime. And this is a belief that you'll find among many academics in biblical departments at universities, unfortunately. A third misunderstanding is misunderstanding the kingdom as present reality. In other words, fully realized. Again, uh, ignoring the already not yet aspect of, of, um, of scripture and having a fully realized eschatology. And the claim in that case is that the message of Jesus was embrace the kingdom. I am the kingdom. So in other words, the kingdom of God arrived through the person and work of Jesus. So there is no need to speak of a future kingdom. Again, very limiting to the biblical idea of kingdom. A fourth one, and this might um, touch a nerve with some of us, is fully equating the kingdom and the church. And the claim here might be that the words kingdom and church are used synonymously by the New Testament writers. And there was a time in our own church that we held this view. For example, Jesus says in Matthew 6 verse 33, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And one can narrowly then say, well, seeking the kingdom first is the same as seeking the church first and you can even more narrowly say well if i attend all church services and i ignore job opportunities in other cities to attend church then i meet that requirement and, and that's again a very narrow view of kingdom which goes far beyond beyond church now let's talk a little bit more about kingdom equals church as a as a misunderstanding John Bright says this really well. He says, there is no tendency in the New Testament to identify, and this is important, the visible church with the kingdom of God. The church that makes such an identification will soon begin to invite God to endorse its very human policies and practices will equate the people of God with those nice people who share its particular beliefs and participate in its services and will reckon the advance of the kingdom in terms of its numerical growth. The church is indeed the people of the kingdom of Christ, but the visible church is not that kingdom. The New Testament church could never be a proud, conquering church as the world understands those terms. It must remain the church of the suffering servant. It had no way but Christ's way to drink his cup, Mark 10, verse 38 to 39, and to take up his cross, Mark 8, verse 34. The next misunderstanding is we could call it the kingdom come theology. The claim they make is that when Jesus preached, he was consumed with eschatological thoughts. He planned on launching his kingdom into the world through his personal ministry, but the world wasn't ready for his kingdom. Therefore, he established his church as a nice compromise for people who weren't ready. They believe that the kingdom will come after several apocalyptic events, including the rapture, Armageddon, and the tribulation of the church, and that after these events, Jesus will establish his kingdom on this earth as a new millennial kingdom. This is a view that is very common among, among evangelicals, and you can already see some of the premillennial thoughts being pictured over there. And this is a, a, a troubling idea that the church is a nice compromise for people who weren't ready for the kingdom, almost like a placeholder. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find the church described in, in this way. In, we are, in fact, the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Now, let's get to a more biblical view of the kingdom. The kingdom as paradox already but not yet steve cannot said describes this very well the kingdom 
can be seen as a multifaceted diamond that contains many levels of distinction and glory. At present, we can experience the kingdom of God. We can, we can, experience, we can experience the kingdom in Jesus and his church, but this present reality is not all there is. We await the future glorious kingdom of God. So right now, we live in tension between two kingdoms, the present kingdom of the church and the future eternal kingdom with God in heaven. Another um, writer says, Jesus therefore preached the kingdom of God, neither solely as a present reality, nor exclusively as a future event. Rather, he was aware that the future rule of God was present in his actions and in his person. He spoke, therefore, of the future kingdom, which would suddenly dawn as already realizing itself in the present. Again, the idea of an already, but not yet. Now, a few concluding thoughts on the nature of king and kingdom. A few things I'd like you to think about the life of Jesus. We, we often talk about, we've often read about the triumph, the triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. But this morning, I want you to think about this in a new way. This was an anti-triumphal entrance into, into Jerusalem. You see, kings and princes and emperors rode mighty war horses accompanied by an entourage of soldiers. They did not ride donkeys. Jesus, through doing this, he was making a spectacle of violence and power. Oh, I need you to see this, that the coming of the kingdom is very different from what people in those days expected. Jesus turned everything upside down. Instead of ruling with a sword, he ruled with a towel. He said, the greatest among you will be my servant. He washed the feet of, of him who would betray him. It's absolutely incredible. Then a few insights that scholars have noted. When one, view, when one reads the, the crucifixion account in the book of Mark, one sees that it has been very specifically structured to, in a sense, mirror the inauguration of a Caesar or an emperor. And I'm going to lead you right now just through some of those, and you'll see how it was written to completely contrast and nullify the power of the world. For example, Caesar's coronation and procession started with the Praetorian Guard gathered in the Praetorium. The would-be Caesar was brought into the middle of the gathering. Jesus, too, was brought into the Praetorium, but in Jerusalem. The whole company of soldiers, at least 200, gathered around him. In Caesar's case, guards went to the temple of Jupiter, Capitolinus, got a purple robe and placed it on the candidate. He was also given an olive leaf wreath made of gold and a scepter for the authority of Rome. Soldiers brought Jesus a wreath as well, but made of thorns. A scepter, an old stick, and a purple robe. Caesar was loudly proclaimed as triumphant by the Praetorian Guard. In Jesus' case, sarcastically, the soldiers acclaimed, mocked, and paid homage to Jesus. For the emperor or Caesar, a procession began through the streets of Rome, led by the soldiers. In the middle was Caesar. Walking behind him was a sacrificial bull. Walking next to the bull was a slave who carried an axe to kill the bull. The procession began, but instead of a bull, the would-be king and guard became the sacrifice. But he could not carry the instrument of death and be the sacrifice. So they stopped Simon and gave him the cross. 
The procession, in Caesar's case, moved to the highest hill in Rome, the Capitoline Hill. In other words, the head hill on this hill is the Capitoline Temple. Jesus was led up to Golgotha, the place of a skull. You could also say that was the head hill. The candidate, in Caesar's case, he stood before the temple altar and was offered by the slave a bowl of wine mixed with myrrh. He took it as if to accept it, and then he gave it back. The slave also refused, and the wine was poured onto the altar or onto the bull. Right after the wine was poured, the bull was killed. Jesus was offered wine, and he refused. Right after it is written, and they crucified him. The Caesar to be gathered his second in command on his right hand and his third in command on his left. Then they ascended to the throne of the Capitolium. In the gospel it records, next came the account of those being crucified on his right and his left. In Caesar's case, the crowd acclaimed the inaugurated emperor for the divine seal of approval. The gods would send signs such as flocks of doves or even a solar eclipse. Jesus, however, was again acclaimed, mocked, and a divine sign confirmed God's presence. The temple curtain was ripped in two. In other accounts, for example, in Matthew, Luke, and John, it says the whole sky became dark and that even the temple, the tombs, burst open. I just wanted to share this with you because it's really something that struck me when I read this um, a few years ago. How radically different our King, King Jesus, is from what the world expected and how glorious his coming is and how glorious the kingdom was and i wanted to share with you how important it is to recognize these aspects of the kingdom and to see how easy it is to misunderstand the nature of the kingdom that it is not of this world but it is in the world that it is indeed within us, that it has already come, yet it will come. Therefore, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we can confidently pray, your kingdom come. Amen.